Hello everyone, thanks again so much for watching. Back here to talk today about some differences in the Gospels. I'll be using some examples that have been uh, advanced to me in the form of a comment by Muslims here on my channel and a couple elsewhere. And I'm even going to throw in some examples that I haven't heard any Muslim raise as an objection. And the reason for doing this is just to give some background information about why some of these differences exist. Okay, so we'll just get right into it and start with Mark chapter 1. Mark's gospel opens with the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. And then he quotes from Isaiah, according to him. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And then he goes on, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Now some scholars see here not only Isaiah uh, and Malachi, as is well known, but also an allusion or a conflation of Exodus 23 as well, namely verse 20 of Exodus 23. So let's just take this worst case scenario and say that Mark is indeed quoting directly or at least alluding to Isaiah, Malachi, and Exodus. Yet he only says, according to the prophet Isaiah. So why could this be? Is this a contradiction? Does Mark not know what he's talking about? I want to present some options from Dr. Ricky Watts' work on the Gospel of Mark. He's a, uh, a very well-known Markan scholar. And he says that Mark himself, by the way, this is um, Isaiah's new Exodus in Mark, and this is page 88. He says, Mark himself is not unfamiliar with the phenomenon of combined texts. And he gives some examples here from a footnote. Um, for example, Mark 13, 24, F combines Isaiah 34, 4, Joel 2, 10, Isaiah 13, 10, and Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Mark 11, 17 is a combination of Isaiah 56, 7, Jeremiah 7, 11, and Mark 14, 62 is a combination of Daniel 7, 13, Psalms 110, 1, and I would add Psalm 8 to that based off of Dr. John Ronning's work as well. Um, and then Mark 1, 11, is a citation of Isaiah 42, 1 and Psalms 2, 7. So this sort of a conflated quote, yet attributing uh, the, the quotation itself to the major prophet is not something unknown in Mark's work. As H.C. Key has shown, that would be Howard Key, Mark seems aware of the significance of such scriptural citations, and he places them at crucial points in his narrative. Uh, possibly, Mark is also, or could be, following a common Jewish practice in naming only one author with composite quotations. And examples of this, he cites Gundry, um, and uh, that would be Gundry's work on uh, Mark as well. Gundry's a, another very, very well-known Markan scholar. And then you also have um, a characteristic Markan technique, namely his sandwich construction. And then Watts here analyzes this quotation and shows that Mark is quoting Isaiah on each side within Exodus and Malachi sandwiched in between. So you have a couple of options. One, this is Mark's style, his own style, that he conflates these quotes. Or two, he is drawing off of rabbinic traditions that did the same thing. Or three, he's using the sandwich um, the sandwich motif. Now, what the, what the sandwich motif is, very technical term, right? Sandwich. You have examples of this in Mark chapter 11. Okay, so think about the fig tree in the way that Mark presents it. You have the fig tree, and then you have Jesus' actions in the temple, and then they go by the fig tree again. Okay, so it's the fig tree and the temple sandwiched between the two. It's not like this in Matthew's narrative, right? The fig tree occurs once. So then you say, well, which was it? Did they go by the fig tree twice or once? Well, Mark is using um, this, again, the sandwich motif in his narrative to do something different with the narrative. Okay, so this is just Mark's style, and that seems to be um, exactly what is in play here in Mark chapter 1 in the opening verses. Now this sort of a thing gives rise to textual variance. If you open your text critical apparatus in Mark chapter 1 uh, in English, uh, verse 2, just or as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. And then there's uh, a symbol here which indicates an insertion. And if you go down to the text critical apparatus, some uh, manuscripts insert the prophets. So some scribes, when they're copying Mark's gospel, came across this. They realized it said Isaiah, and he's quoting multiple prophets, 
And so instead of writing the prophet Isaiah, they would write the prophets. And that would clarify, um, for them at least, what Mark is doing. Now, these weren't Mark and scholars. They didn't go through um, you know, all of the, the, the resources, things that we have available today. Maybe they didn't know about this rabbinic tradition or whatever it was. But for some reason, this bothered some scribes. And so they would make a change, and they would say, the prophets. Now, personal opinion, who cares? Very minor change, and um, we can analyze Mark's gospel as a whole and see what he was doing with his narrative and with his quotations. And it's a pretty fascinating study, for sure. Second example I will use is one that was raised in a comment recently, and it was the third hour they crucified in Mark 15, and when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, etc. Uh, it was about the sixth hour, John 19. So this has to do with chronology between Mark's gospel, or the synoptics in general, and John's gospel with respect to to the events surrounding the Passion narrative. Now, I will say, before I go any further, that R.T. France has analyzed these timetables um, in his commentary. That's the um, New International Greek Testament Commentary, I think NIGTC, if I have that abbreviation right, series. So if you want to read a very good analysis, you can go there and uh, consult um, R.T. France's work on that particular topic. But let's just say here that John has changed the timetable. Let's just say that for the sake of argument. Um, I'm going to group this in with some other examples. Okay, Luke 24, last chapter of Luke. Um, Jesus appears, you know, to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then makes some other appearances. And there's the phrase, depending on the translation, the same day that occurs um, once or twice on the same day. So Jesus kind of zips around to various places on the same day. And then when you look in Acts, same author, the opening chapter, Jesus' post-resurrection appearances occur over a 40-day period. Okay, So one day versus 40 days, same author wrote both accounts. So what's going on here? And in the grand scheme of things, what's going on with the chronology in general between Jesus' passion, narratives, the synoptics versus the Gospel of John, and certainly Luke's chronology here, as well as other places where we see chronology handled differently between the Gospels. Well, Dr. Mike Lacona has done a lot of work on this, and I'm going to cite a couple of examples that he gives um, from his work. So Lucian, How to Write History from the 2nd Century, so uh, contemporary to the Gospel writers a little bit later, says, for all the body of the history is simply a long narrative, so let it be adorned with the virtues proper to narrative, progressing smoothly, evenly, and consistently, free from humps and hollows. Then let its clarity be limpid, achieved, as I have said, both by diction and the interweaving of the matter. For he will make everything distinct and complete, and when he has finished the first topic, he will introduce the second, fastened to it and linked with it like a chain to avoid breaks and a multiplicity of disjointed narratives. No, always the first and second topics must not merely be neighbors, but have common matter and overlap. Look at the phrases he uses. Fastened to it and linked with it like a chain to avoid breaks and a multiplicity of disjointed narratives. Now, when you think about this, and you think about Luke's last chapter, where Jesus, on the same day, he does you know, all of this stuff, that's exactly what comes to mind. This was a good way to write history according to their standards. Now, in Acts, Luke mentions the 40-day period. He chooses not to employ um, this motif. Uh, but he does in the last chapter of his gospel. So this is an acceptable method for them to link together historical events like a chain so that the narrative continues progressing rapidly from one um, event to the next. It's just what they did. It was good history in their day. Some other examples Dr. Lacona cites would be uh, Tacitus, who moves the suicide of Piso back several months to add more force to his narrative. That's in the Annals, um, Tacitus writings. Also, Sallust, in two parallel accounts, moves the speech of Catiline forward in one and backward in another narrative to suit his purpose. 
So we have to understand when we look at the chronology that the gospel writers and indeed their contemporaries did not treat it the same way we would today. Now I freely admit that Mark's citation of Isaiah, Malachi, Exodus would not be acceptable by today's standards and scholarship. Uh, you couldn't be like you know Dr. Watts and write a book here on the gospel of Mark or a particular uh, theme that Mark uses. You couldn't do that and go around citing a bunch of Old Testament passages um, and attributing them to the same author. You couldn't cite a bunch of conflations you know, and attribute, it, attribute them to Isaiah or Jeremiah or whatever the case would be. In the same way, modern history writers don't have the freedom to move events in their timeline back and forth to reinforce a particular point in the narrative or to add to the force of their narrative. We don't have those options. But back in their day, this was something that was considered good history. And it seems to be something that the gospel writers employed. And it actually makes it very interesting from my perspective. When you see differences, the fig tree again is a perfect example. Mark's sandwich narrative or sandwich motif of the fig tree narrative compare that to Matthew and you see they're different. Well, why did Mark do this? Well, he did it so that one account would interpret the other. The fig tree helps interpret the temple. The temple, uh, Jesus' actions in the temple help interpret what happens with the fig tree. So when you see differences like this and you realize that these were methods they employed, it's a good idea to say, why does this difference exist? What uh, narrative force was the gospel writer trying to use to uh, when, he, when he was writing his account. So uh, these are just a couple of examples of differences in the gospels, and in some cases why textual variants arise from those differences. And I hope this helps people understand sort of what's going on there, a little bit of behind the scenes uh, with the gospel writers. So thanks for watching.